Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Today's episode is about, um, obviously, you've seen the title. It's about fearing being who you are or being yourself. And it kind of dawned on me that that's exactly one of the biggest problems we have on this planet. Is that... uh, It came from a huge change that Marshall McLuhan was trying to tell us about. Medium is the message, right? So, my whole life I've been, I think, pretty much exactly who I wanted to be whenever I wanted to be it. And I think it's because... I had no brothers or sisters pushing me around. I think that uh, the only older person in my life at a youthful range was uh, a cousin of mine. And he was so, you know, the people have to be cooler than you or someone you would look up to before you're going to change who you are. So my only input to decide who I was going to be, which didn't happen until later. It was probably a movie. I'm not sure there's any television show I can put, put my finger on before. I don't even know if that's ever happened. Definitely movies, though. Heroes, right? But, I mean, how much can you emulate that kind of thing? But that's me. Let's genericize this thing. Let's think about two different kids. They're going to be about 150 years apart from each other. Let's say one kid is in 1870 on a plane in Kansas. And the other dude's in 2020 in the heart of any major city in the world. Let's do Los Angeles since I live next to Los Angeles. So the kid in the 1870s, let's do him first. Regardless if he has brothers or sisters, he's on a little prairie farm with a house he's got duties and he doesn't have a lot of people around him other than his family there's no tv there's no radio maybe a telegram comes in every once in a while but that's that's actually an extremely rare thing for a family in in those settings what's their life like well, let's get up in the morning, go take care of all the animals, make sure everything's fed. Uh, usually you can get some animals out depending on what the season is. And then you probably have to go farm, work the crops. Uh, depending on what time of year it is, the kid will have to go to school, depending on how old he is. Well, she's a boy. But this is generic right across the board, except for females do get more attacked in the current 2020 scenario. So we'll do all over as well. But the kid is is experiencing the necessities of life within a team atmosphere, which is the family. I think most of you know that families that used to farm used to have lots of kids. And the goal is to create little workers and to... Populate the country, of course, which, you know, at that point in time, we were pretty much the the invaders from Europe. Now, the kid grows up, just keeps growing up, growing up. But those formative 10 years, for sure, are going to be a regimented loop of work, learn, work, sleep, repeat. Of course, when the kid hits his teen years, he's going to be looking at some girl at school, some girl, you know, down the, down the road. It's going to be a lot of effort to get around. There's no cars. It's horseback or walking. And in terms of forming any image of himself, it's going to be based on what life is about. How much time would that kid have to be derailed from perhaps his parents' upbringings, which are going to spread through the family, depending on if he's the 10th child or the first child. Not a whole lot. 
maybe the kid maybe would go into town and get a little uh, sort of Western fictional book about something. But even that really didn't come around by the 1870s. You needed to kind of get through the 70s to get all your Dodge City, Tombstone, all those wild stories. From, as far as the world news, he doesn't have any. His parents don't have any. No, I'm sure if dad's in the uh, hardware store or the grocery, there'll be someone saying something about who's president, who's running. You'd hear this, the law's coming, da da da. We bought this giant piece of land. It might be folded into the, the colonies. But overall, the kid's by himself with his family's influence, carrying down the family traditions. In a female sense, it might be in addition to everything the boy is doing. And hopefully the boy is learning how to build a barn. He's learning how to plow a field. He's learning the mechanisms that a man has to command in order to run a family. The girls will get a little bit more arts and crafts. Back in those days, they'd carry down all the recipes of the family, which are absolute gems. They're probably making and mending clothing, things like that. All of it good, all of it fun. They're all raising each other, right? So let's say the kid's the firstborn out of 10. Well, he's going to be literally holding his brothers and sisters, feeding them, taking care of them. If he's the middle kid, he's just swamped. He's got five over and four under. Now let that sink in for just a second. He's undisturbed. Therefore, if the family has their act together, that kid and all of his brothers and sisters also have a very high likelihood of having their act together. Trade skills, important trade skills that actually feed the family, that nurture the land, keep them warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Oh, sure, they play and they do all those kind of things. With 10 kids, they might get 10 cakes a year, maybe. Unless a couple kids are close in age. But they have to appreciate less than we appreciate today in terms of overall units of things they could appreciate because they don't get a lot. Hopefully, without me even going to 2020, the nightmare of today that's interfering with both young people and older people trying to deal with who they are is starting to become really evident. So that kid is looking at a reflective surface, if they even have one. He's trying to decide who he is. Is it even a question? I'm going to guess not much. He's just who he is. He just has the directives that he has. Now, I got sort of a hundred-year upgrade to that, where I grew up in a really small town, and, you know, everything was about the town. The town itself was physically endearing. The people were amazing because everybody was in check. You weren't a jerk anywhere because if you were a jerk, well, you you get corrected. You'd have problems getting service. People talk about you. Your buddies might come over and go, what's wrong, man? But I honestly, I didn't hear about much of those scenarios in my hometown at all. Now, let's fast forward. 100 and, I guess, 50 years, right? Kid is born in 2020. Now, we can ignore some of the stuff uh, that's going on specific to this year to make our point. Now, we're also going to infer backwards for those of you who are older. If you can hear my voice, you weren't born yesterday. But think about it. As soon as a smartphone came out, as soon as a tablet came out, parents just give these things to their kids to shut them up. Kids are born in a chaotic hurricane of messages. And parents don't seem to understand that their kids actually get the messages. You know, a ton of the listeners on this show have reported in, they get it. I encourage you to be as much like them as you possibly can. You know, it used to be that 
when I was a kid, my father goat went to work, earned a paycheck, came home, and all the bills got paid. And then over, you know, second and third decade of my life, well, the two-income household was created to tax the other half of the population, as Tony Rockefeller told Aaron Russo, not to give women their rights. Like I've said in several shows recently, it's always good to remember that being a mother was demonized. Being a mother was, you know, the, the cliches of barefoot and pregnant went out. Make me a sandwich. Everything that insults being a wife, being a mother, was being insulted. And people buy it. People buy it. Men buy it. Women buy it. And so going out and working for a corporation and being a slave is the awesome big win. It's what man has been trying to get rid of in his life since the beginning. That's why men try to, you know, and women now, of course, um, go towards entrepreneurship. Everybody, regardless of what gender you are, wants out of the game as soon as you get in the game because you realize you have no control. You could do be much better than everyone else at your work and you never get a bonus. You never get a disproportionate raise up over the person that's not doing a job, good job at all. And we're going to go on the outside of the onion and then go in, right? The you being yourself is going to be the second stage. But without understanding the climate that you live in, it might seem to be a bit of a mystery. But what does it mean to be yourself? It means you're making choices. Should it be this way? Should it be that way? Well, you have to come back out to the outside of the onion. Because it's all about your influences. It's all about how many voices would you say if every page on your phone was, a, was an individual voice, meaning every individual article that you read, even if it's just a headline, is a, is a unique voice. Every radio program you hear, television show, people talking. If that's all a unique voice, how many voices would you say you hear in a day? Even someone repeating what someone else said because they watch TV a lot. Well, those voices are just being passed to you. It clouds anyone's ability to choose who the hell they are. You know, candy vending machines have been around for a really, really long time, right? And what's really interesting is I remember being a kid and that just being, you know, like visiting Willy Wonka's wall, just looking inside of any machine, all these choices. And I thought I had a tremendous amount of choices in the 70s. But you go to a fully stocked vending machine in the 20s, 2020, and it's like that times four. There's so much stuff in the machine. You're like, oh my God, you go into anxiety. In fact, there was the guy from, I think, Fridays. He used to create these weird words. It was part of his little show. And he created a word for that, that anxiety you get when you're trying to pick what you want in the machine. It's so true, isn't it? So before there's any pressure to be one way or the other, the sheer number of choices as dictated by voices, very propagandized voices, voices with agendas, voices with narratives, voices with goals. Well, they're like a chorus of chaos. No one is singing in the same key. And so it just sounds like absolute static in our minds. And then there is sort of a, a subdermal influence, which is not a voice necessarily, but an action. Something you're seeing. Do you wear a mask or don't you? No one has to necessarily tell you before you're going to start feeling the pressure. When you go to a beach, how do you behave? When you drive a car, how do you behave? When you go to dinner in public, how do you behave? Now, some people don't notice anything, right? They have 22 kids. They go to a restaurant at nine o'clock at night and they're, they've just, they've, They've screwed too much. They've had too many kids. And then they just let the restaurant be a playground, destroying everyone else's experience. And that's a low vibration person. Eh, can't do much about that. Believe me, they probably are who they want to be. Or not want to be, but they're who they are, you know. I see people struggle. 
trying, and I've seen this my entire life, and I've never understood personally anything more than the mechanic, the academic mechanic of peer pressure. Meaning I know what it is. I mean, I know what, what they say it is. But, and, and you do have the inverse person. And it could be dangerous being the inverse person, which is that person that says, you can't tell me what to do. And they are the specimen that invented reverse psychology. A low vibration person will let peer pressure get to them. But a low vibration person will also be even, I think, more dangerous than the person that can't make a decision or is letting everyone tell them what to do. The person that says, I, you can't tell me what to do. Well, you just tell them what you don't want them to do and they'll go do the opposite. And so you can guide them right where you want them. This is how coups that turn into civil wars happen. You tell a group of people what to do. You tell them who they are. You make them victims. And they get all upset because inside you can just see their anger. And they have legitimate reasons sometimes to be angry. I think everyone has a reason to be angry in this world today about something. Some common law things being broken against them. Yeah. And so if you just poke a little hole and you let the, the air come out, you might get them to be in control. Like, what if they go to a great comedy show or they see a good movie or they go on vacation or they go to Disneyland or something and they replenish in their soul the fuel of goodness, whatever your definition is. Well, then you can exude what you put in. A lot of times those little refueling stops are uh, not enough. It's just a little tiny droplet that gets spent really, really fast. We have this gene in us, this prime directive within us that developed from a prehistoric setting that is the driving force behind anyone that is contemplating whether or not to care about what someone else thinks about them, thus allowing someone else to mold them or to perhaps conflict with what they would truly want to be. And that is the tribalism instinct in a man. I don't think any of us, besides maybe some military trained people or some preppers, have taken that kind of survivalistic training, really have a warm fuzzy about being pushed in the middle of a forest to live pushed into a desert, a plain, a mountain, whatever. Because you know that what you would need to live is a tremendous effort every single day if you don't have grocery stores and doctors. And so we've seen it. We've seen the horror in our past of people that were kicked out of the village. And we know, and then just like a few hours later, we hear a a tiger or a lion or a bear just eat them alive in the in the forest and that blood curdling scream and all the death and later you find their body You're like oh my god it was traumatic to see their face when they got kicked out it was traumatic when they got eaten up it's traumatic that i found them and you don't want to be that person and just that primal instinct that's been installed into man over however many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years of evolution or design keeps us in check. And so taken to the extreme, we can go with the flow. And one of the reasons I want to make this episode is that I met a guy who makes a business out of it when it within himself. And that's my little phrase for it. He is so industrialized ass kissing in his life that he's no longer himself. He's kind of a, what I would say to be sort of a useless copy of bad doctrine. And he's the kind of guy that if you sat down and you 
let's say that you were an investigative intelligence officer. You have physically seen things with your own eyes that are horrific, all this crazy stuff going on in the world. You've seen it. You've seen Anthony Weiner's insurance folder. You've been on a plane with Kintrell chemicals being loaded, and you've heard the debriefing about it. You went to NASA and were fully debriefed that the moon missions didn't occur. On and on and on. And then you sit down with this guy who doesn't really want to hear anything that you have to say. What he wants to do is fight away his own fear, his own cowardice. Because what he chose to be was safe. And instead of disliking the process, he made a business out of it within himself. It's what turns him on, is to say, oh man, I'm not like those crazy people. I'm totally centered and functional. When in the end, he's an empty carcass with a mouth, right? I just had this experience. Dude was uh, immediately trying to separate himself from me and trying to put me down inside his feeble mind. And he was like, well, you know, you're one of those conspiracy theorists. All of you have experienced it. It was a faux methodology for his feeble mind to take a step over yours or over mine. Like I said in uh, the low vibration episode, I said, there's a lot of people who believe the world is flat. And a lot of folks that have never done any research ever will make fun of those people. And this guy did it. This guy did it. He kept trying to throw out more and more extremes to try and lock me down in something I believed so that he could say, oh my God, you believe in that. Trying to take his feeble perception of himself, which is way inside of his character and his id, and jack it up that day. Going home most likely with a very empty form of satisfaction that he basically outclassed the information that I was bringing by way of just randomly meeting him. And I just kept sitting there looking at the guy and just thinking, you have chosen to be this person out of sheer fear of being perhaps actually intelligent. He doesn't want to get out of there. You know, he's probably got a comfy life with whatever his circle is. And what was funny is no matter how much science I dumped on this guy, no matter how much I interrogated his lack of science, he would have to constantly admit in our conversation, yeah, I don't know anything about that. And then I'd say, well, I know a hell of a lot of, about that. Professionally, in some cases. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was a nuclear physicist and he had never heard of the word. He was still more of a physicist than I was. And it's just a fictitious example, but you get what I'm saying. Right now, we have, in 2020, a bunch of these people that were raised on cell phones, raised on TV. I mean, remember Cable Guy. Remember Ben Stiller's Cable Guy. Jim Carrey, Matthew Broderick, and Cage. You know why that movie is considered a comedy? And for those of you who didn't see it, it's about a character that was raised by a TV because his mother was constantly going out on dates. And then he's really a weird guy. It's a comedy because the TV raised this guy. But it's no longer a comedy in 2020. Because that's exactly how most parents raise their children. Watch the TV. Shut up. Here's your phone. Don't you have your cell phone? Isn't it charged? Here's my, here's my tablet. And they'll take pictures of their children on these devices. Some of them have educational games going, so that's actually not a bad thing. If you're controlling the content, more power to you. A lot of times the kids are just out there surfing around. Imagine dad's uh, internet history coming up in front of a four-year-old. But now it's become a little more insidious than that, hasn't it? it? Used to be that it was we thought for ourselves, like the prairie kid, 
life simply dictated needs and you followed up with methodologies of becoming the person, male or female, that would fill those needs. And because those needs and those models were built up over, again, tens of thousands of years, the nuclear family was an amazing thing. People enjoy nuclear families. They enjoy their mothers and fathers getting along and being in the same household because they're not financially stressed. They're not ingesting everyone else's problems 24-7. They're not arguing over politics or religion. They just got along. It's a beautiful place. I lived in those places. I lived in a world where that was 98% of the scenario in the town, if not higher. Then it was sort of um, a step up slowly. It was, we want you to desire things. So we're going to create marketing departments. The most fundamental conspiracy group in the world against humanity is a marketing department trying to get you to buy something you don't need over someone else's product that you don't need. Who also has a marketing department? You can't just be left to choice. It's got to be a marketing thing. People run for office through PR firms, which are an upper level human marketing team, trying to get you to believe in someone that may or may not have your best interests, but they know whether or not there's something that you don't like and they hide that and they blow smoke or the sun don't shine to make you believe something that you do want. I'll give you a case in point. I believe it was 2016 where Veritas stung, but it might have been 18, I'm not quite sure. But Veritas stung a woman running for the governor of Missouri. And she was trying to play a moderate. She knows that Missouri loves guns. And let me tell you, they love guns. Oh my gosh. They got the big ones. And so she kept telling everyone, oh, I would never go after the Second Amendment. That's what makes me different from my party. Well, it would have been nice if that was really her stance, but Project Veritas got into her campaign and dude filmed a bunch of hipsters running her campaign. And he says, uh, well, what is our stance on Second Amendment? Oh, she's going to get rid of the guns automatically. She's just lying to them about keeping their guns. Boom, she's gone. That video aired. Missouri stomped her out like a, like a lit coal. But a PR firm taught her how to lie. It happens to be called the DNC in that particular realm. But by the time I was a kid, you know, you start getting uh, tiny agendas, very, very testy kind of agendas coming in the late 70s by, you know, the Midwest anyway. Maybe in New England, it was way more intense. But fast forward 30 years, and you now have... Groups trying to program your children to be absolutely and utterly confused about who they are as a human being. Trying to tell your children that they do not have two genders. There's two. Biologically provable and a court of law. Now, you can be mentally ill and be and identify as a tiger person or a ninja turtle or whatever. And you can surgically alter your face to be whatever the hell you want. That's your choice. Again, not harming me. Do no harm. Good. We're all thumbs up there. LGBT is obviously linked to this non-gender thing. Really? Two girls like two girls. Okay. There's your L. Two boys like two boys. There's your G. B? You like either one. B. T, well, you like to dress, usually it's a man dressing like a woman. If you uh, identify as something else, well, you typically are a guy identifying as a girl, a girl identifying as a guy. You feel like you have that in your soul. You're still acknowledging just two genders and you get all LGBT together. There you go. We're good. You got H for the rest of us and LGBT for everybody else. But now it's like if you want to wear a unicorn outfit all day long. They create a gender for that. A gender. Hmm. Programming. But it gets more insidious than that. Every human being, and I've been saying on the show forever, has a rite of passage moment. 
If you're a boy, you're to take over for your father's decision-making process. The way that you work, the rite of passage is first from the primal animals that we still see to this day. I think monkeys are pretty good for us, apes or whatever. Apes, let's do apes. Well, dad's in charge. Dad made you. He's the alpha male, gorilla, whatever. Okay, well, eventually you got to knock the old man out. Well, he's your dad. What happens when you knock out dad? Well, you get to have a bunch of inbred sex with your sisters and maybe even your mom, right? The Oedipus complex right there in the jungle, right in front of your face. Freud was just simply putting it in easier terms, maybe not even easier terms, but different terms so you can understand on a human level. Same thing with the lionesses. They have to fight to get the male to impregnate them. They have a desire. It's built in them. So every teenage boy and every teenage girl, I probably did this at four, I don't know, but there's a rite of passage where you push it all out and you're like, I am smart enough to at least make these basic decisions that are governing my existence. We're not doing anything super scientific here, guys. I get up, I brush my teeth, I take a shower, I clean my butt, I do whatever I got to do, get dressed, go to school, go to work, whatever. I can make these decisions. I don't need your help, okay? Then you get into the psychological elements of the world, boyfriends, girlfriends, and maybe if you're smart, you will lean on your parents if they are smart enough to help you. So, the people that hatch these programs for us that are trying to redesign the world to be utterly as chaotically dysfunctional as they are, and remember, a drunk always wants you to be a drunk. Therefore, they're not a drunk. We're all just drinkers, right? So, a crazy person wants you to be crazy, or a confused person wants you to be confused. So, they're normal. If there's a such a uh, definition of you know, normality at all. So they know that you, they can get your kid at the rite of passage. Your kid is genetically trying to start anew. Why do you think music has always been thrown away and reinvented? Part of it does come from the, the industry itself is me, has made it mechanical at this point. But it, before a music company said, no, we don't want to listen to Glenn Miller anymore. We want to listen to Little Richard. No, not Little Richard, the Beatles, you know, on and on and on. It happened organically first. And the record company, company simply recognized it and industrialized it. So when you find something is malleable, it's like clay. You can change it. You know, there's that saying, they say, don't let a crisis go to waste. Well, don't let any opportunity go to waste is probably an easier way to say it because it doesn't take a crisis for these people to be interested in doing what they do, especially if they can mold society. A lot of you know about the MK Ultra program, which this person I talked to mentioned as if it might be true. What a moron. It's the one secret program, the United States of America, that actually paid damages to the people that were in it. It's not secret. To an idiot, it's secret. Agenda 21 ain't secret. So, when the government figured out that these German scientists who were Nazis had figured out methods of controlling the human mind, regardless of whether or not it's complete or partial, they got very excited. Let me ask you this question. And for those of you who haven't heard this kind of news before, I apologize for being the first one to tell you, but I, I would find it shocking if you haven't heard this kind of news. We have children under 10 getting sexual reassignment surgery and just happen to have massively liberal parents. In some cases, it's a split decision. The father's like, what? I paid extra money, honey, so you could stay home. Not so you could watch TV, find some trend to make you feel important to then Munchausen by proxy our son's genitals off of his body. You got him fully convinced that's what he wants to do when he has no clue what he wants to do. But that stuff's happening. How do you think it happens? Now, 
again, people are gay. It happens, right? Again, in my family alone, and we had uh, back in the 40s and 50s, we had a married-in woman who um, had two sons, wanted a daughter, begged her husband for the third child, had another son, and couldn't handle it. So she dressed her son like a little girl until he was 12. And guess what happened? He likes guys now. He's a wonderful human being. But I think that she, quite scientifically, made that decision for him. But I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't be utterly offended by the fact that that was his life story. And I've seen a picture of him as a little girl on a farm in the Midwest. So it can happen as an individual thing, and it can happen as an outside influence to a parent down to a child. It can also happen directly to the child. That's why you absolutely have to prioritize your child's life once they're born. They're number one, you're number two. And if you can't make that sacrifice, don't be having any kids. Because that's the rule. I mean, you can't pull it off well as an adult if you make them number two and you number one. Now, yes, you have to take care of the bills and all that good stuff. You might construe that as a number one, but it's not really. If your kid calls and they're not playing you, they're number one. But even if they're playing you, they got something wrong with them and you need to straighten that out in a wonderful, loving way. I really feel for people today who are struggling to figure out who they are. Because when I was a kid, it was pretty basic. I mean, seriously, I don't even know what binary decisions we had to make as a kid. You know, it might be, uh, do you like this music? I remember one time in high school, um, I was a Prince fan, you know, like in 1981. And nobody knew who the guy was. He was definitely weird, uh, you know, visually uh, at least, right? Amazing musician, of course, right? But I remember standing in line at school, and this was a peer pressure moment that I sort of felt uncomfortable with. And I, there, was, there was a guy who was older than me. He was standing in line, and he, I think, had said something like he didn't like Prince a couple of years ago, right? And so... Purple Rain was up there. We had 1999. The dude is all over the charts. So, you know, he's made a bunch of great music. And I can't remember if I asked him or someone else asked him. I can't remember. But I remember him getting asked if he liked Prince after two years. Now, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But the look on his face was like he had no choice but to say yes. It's a petty thing. But that's about as severe as it was when I was a kid. The only other thing was... Someone offering you a cigarette. That's why I started my first cigarette at nine years old. Dude said, well, can you smoke cigarettes? And I was like, sure. And he gave me one. Well, can you inhale? I'm like, sure. And I'm like, I'm just making this up. Now, I think I was watching. No, no, my parents hadn't smoked at all. My grandparents had smoked. That's how I got started. And I got super addicted for about a year and a half. But then there was a point I was actually running and playing hide and go seek and like, 10, probably 10, I had a pack of cigarettes in my pocket and I went around a corner and hid behind some bush thing in my apartment complex. And I remember I was out of, I was out of air. I was winded. And I was like, they always said the cigarettes would make you winded. And I took that pack of cigarettes out, which was like bars of gold, man. It was a Winston pack with filters, man. I just switched over to filters after a year of non-filters. I put it on the ground and I stomped it. And I never, well, I smoked a couple more times to prove I didn't like smoking, but I didn't, um, I didn't inhale any more cigarettes, man. But just think about it today, man. Think about it today. So let's break it down a little bit. The kid thing we just talked about. It's, um, you know, it's parents trying to create a, um, and I don't know what it is. I mean, there's this thing of trying to be in the in crowd or trying to be the rebellious one. In my hometown, we have a few people online who are just, just all I can say is abject morons. They, when you question them about anything that they supposedly post on their Facebook page as to having any knowledge about what they're talking about, they've got zero 
And so they do what Democrats do, which is to call you a name. That's their game. You know, Alex Jones has had shakes thrown on him and, you know, that was the new thing. So now if you, they say, oh, Trump's a racist, you know, okay, well, let's, let's have it. Let's, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll call him a racist if he is one. Let's, let's have it. Spit on you. Hmm. I mean, is this an intelligent slice of humanity that we're enabling or perhaps the contrary? I mean, since we are in a fight for the entire planet's sovereignty at this point, I thought maybe talking about it might help. But we have this new silent majority. It shouldn't be silent. Why is it silent? Well, it's silent for a very good reason. Crazy just grabbed a few, you know, Molotov cocktails, and they got George Soros to fund them. They've joined a fascist group to kill fascism. Absolutely hysterical, man. They've removed all doubt by opening their mouths that they're complete idiots. I mean, can't prove their own points. I mean, it's not name calling back the other way when you're sitting there going, sit down with me and debate this man. Spit, shake, name calling. And you're just like, the interesting irony about it is that the conspiracy people have been dealing with this for forever. A second you say, the Harvey Oswald and Kennedy, what are you kidding me? Did you see the shot? Did you see the evidence? It's like, this is nuts. And then it's like, how dare you? It's done in religion too. If you do your research, you're going to come up with a completely different belief system about everything. You might keep the message, but in the end, you'll go, don't, don't lecture me about proof, dude. And then you pull out your tome of fiction to make me believe that this is true. That ain't a conversation. That's like me saying, you don't think Spider-Man's real? Well, here's all the Spider-Man comic books. See, Spider-Man comic books say Spider-Man is real. And that's not a conversation. That's intelligent. That's like passive bulliness, right? But let's get out of the kid phase and let's go up to the adults of today, which is where this whole thing is occurring. Well, it's gotten to the point now where there is now hundreds of articles online globally that if you support certain unpopular people or things or actions or belief systems that are not violating common law, okay? You could be a crazy person saying that, you know, uh, what is it the new? Is uh, Age Fluidity is the new Democrat platform where they're trying to literally say, that a grown man can identify as a little girl and he can molest a boy. It's called age fluidity. Unbelievable. He's age fluid. <laughs> Take your pick what party you want to be on, man. Because I don't know how many liberals will go for that one who are just normal liberal people, right? But today employers will fire you for your social media post. In America, we've had, I don't know, I don't even know how many, dozens and dozens and dozens of people fired for saying they like the President of the United States. Because they just keep a little list of everything that he's done since he's been in office. My new friends that are awake are doing that. They're keeping a list of everything that he's done that actually impacts their life, makes things better, improves the country. They're black and white on a piece of paper. Benefiting all people, all genders, all races. Now, what's really interesting between politics and religion in America, at least, I can't speak for your country, if you don't live here, is that it used to be like that for religion, right? Remember the Inquisitions of Europe? If you didn't say you loved Jesus, the Pope hired mercenaries to go kill you, to torture you and kill you. If you didn't turn over your soul to Jesus. This went on for nearly a thousand years, formally, and then informally, who knows, probably another five or 600 years. But now what's interesting is, think about it today. Let's say you went to uh, one of these restaurants that has to pull their whole crew outside, which is the worst configuration for a virus, right? If I coughed inside and I 
you know, cover my mouth, yeah, there's going to be a cloud around me a little bit. But if I cough and there's a gust of wind, it can go 30 feet into someone's face. It's just great. But let's just say you're in public. You sit down with some of your friends and you say, you know, guys, I, I don't mean to offend you whatsoever, but I don't believe in any religions. I just don't. I've done my research. 20 years, I became an anthropologist and an archaeologist and a historian. And so I'm very well versed in all things. I've read 200 books. I just don't think that any of that stuff is actually real. Now, I love the message, but I don't think it's real. And most of the people today in America, I don't care if you went to the Bible Belt in the South, they're not going to kill you across the table. You won't get fired as long as you can articulate the fact that you still care about humanity. But you're not, you're not pro, you know, anti-common law stuff, right? But today, if you sit at tables, depending on where you are in the world, and you go, I love Donald Trump. I think he's great. There's some tables that will just spit in your face. And you could have a movie producer in front of you, someone, a script writer. You could have someone amazing in front of you who has a high IQ where they need it, right? Socially, maybe it's at zero. Intellectually, eh, there's different categories of the little pie and the trivial pursuits. And their social ones really down. They're psychopaths or sociopaths, right? And they're, but they're amazing at what they do. Right. But right now we're at an utter high of political inability to discuss differences. And why is that? I mean, politics has been around for a long time. Religion has been around for a long time. Well, it's a little complex, but the basic reason is, is that politics is recently getting manipulated at a level that is so blatant that once we took a position of putting our country first in this country of America, we found all the cockroaches at the top that were actually serving other people. And then we found the loyalists through peer pressure or ignorance that supported them. And they're coming out against us at the bottom level. All we're saying is we want the country to be better because left or right, the presidents haven't done much in a really, really long time. Like to a point where almost no one remembers the last time anything was passed by their government that helped them out. I mean, the 60s got the civil rights and desegregation, that kind of stuff. Thumbs up, man. We got seatbelts. Okay, that's pretty good. And then it goes dry. But religion has been a war that's been fought for thousands of years. And so all that blood that was spilled in Europe, it was mainly satiated over there. And when you came over here, we still had Salem's witch hunt and we had um, Joseph Campbell was murdered for his beliefs, and whatever. So we have had, you know, religious prosecution since the uh, Inquisition days, but it's, it's a fraction of what it used to be. And especially on the personal level, we typically just know that those conversations are acidic. But it, the reason why I'm mentioning that, I'm not trying to make this a political episode, but that's a really intense thing that's going on right now to give you a perfect example of the people, and, and we're all guilty of it, where we're in a public situation and someone's saying something and uh, we don't retort. Like my writing mentor, very liberal guy, believes in a lot of things I don't believe. Although I think the next time I'm going to eat with him, it's going to be a different game. But here's what happens in that conversation. He will bash our president like crazy, say outrageous, ridiculous things that aren't true. I mean, to the point where he said that uh, Donald Trump is incapable of reading. Right? It's like he got a degree, dude, and he was really good. And, you know, uh, but he, was, he literally said it like it was real. Now we've seen him read miles of teleprompters and speeches, and it's like, give me a break, man. But what I don't do, partly because I don't want to sink to that level, is I don't throw positives back. 
I mean, I do, but I really kind of do like a twilight zone. I sneak it into another story because I don't think I'm dealing with a completely developed person in that realm of thinking because there's anger, right? One of the most brilliant things I ever heard, and I don't, can't remember what context it was in, was that anger is a sign of a lack of intelligence. And we're all guilty of it. But I mean, God, just measure how much you're angry throughout the day. For no apparent reason, let's just put it that way. To find, not to be unable to find a solution, because most men are known men, men, not these betas that are out there. Most men want to solve problems because we don't have time for your whiny moany crap. Thank you for mentioning it to me. Uh, let's wipe the tears off. Now, the only thing that's going to replace those tears with glistening eyes of happiness is for you to watch me destroy what is causing those tears. So just watch this. The guy pulls out all of his wisdom and all of his knowledge and he conquers that thing and gets it out of there. We know that the Venetians, they love to, to wallow in that emotion because that for them is a dopamine dropping loop that is entertaining and almost sexually arousing to complain and cry for some people. And the most attractive Venetians are the ones that don't do that. They're badasses that solve problems just as good as the Martians. Now let's go back to the major theme of this. Now that we've given some examples that are very current. You will hear people tell you things sometimes like advice that seems inconceivable. Or you'll hear sometimes advice that you know is true. But for some reason, you got to block. Now, I'm going to give you an example related to this show. And then I'm going to give an example that's going to hopefully make the first one seem a lot easier. If you've suffered from anxiety of what other people think about you, then that's an insecurity, right? That means you're not your best. So if I said to you, you know what? I have rarely, if ever, cared what anyone thinks about me. I mean, maybe the girl I'm trying to date, right? But even that, if I got to work really, really hard to make a girl like me, she's the wrong person woman. She's the wrong person. And nothing wrong with her. She has her preferences. I miscalculated. I didn't ask the right questions at the beginning, or maybe this is the first date and I'm figuring it out. And there you go. We can be friends, but we can't take it to that next level. And a lot of people are bizarrely annoying human beings that don't understand that they are repulsive. They're human repellent. It's just all built into their system. But they're, they don't care what you think, and so they hang on to that. Hey, two thumbs up for them, but they're going to die alone unless they can find someone who is absolutely born to be perfectly compatible with them. That almost never happens, right? We have areas of our life that we will change because we don't care. We want the seat up or seat down. Either way, I can do this, right? Tube on, tube off, whatever you, you know, like those things I don't care about. It's definitely not worth losing a great, rewarding relationship for. And so you change those things. When you make the bed every day, I don't mind. If that's what it's going to do to keep our relationship together, that's nothing. What we got here is priceless, right? But out of those realms, if I told you, who cares what anyone thinks about you in social media? Well, you know, save your employer um, trying to fire you through sheer discrimination, which is illegal as hell. Proving it's the other problem. But some people have so much anxiety, they look at that statement and they yeah, well, that's easy for you. You're confident and you don't have these problems. You don't have a whole history of this worried about what other people think. Okay. But now let's talk about getting in shape. Let's say you're overweight. Let's say you're not overweight. Let's just say you just, you need to firm up a little bit. But let's say you were a little, a few pounds overweight and you're 10 to 15 pounds overweight and, and you haven't worked out ever in your whole life or you used to, but that's 20 years ago. And I say, well, you know how to fix that, right? It's easy. 
Stop eating crappy food. Eat healthy food. Get a good night's rest. Don't stress yourself out. And those are the weights over there. Have you ever seen a push-up? you ever seen a sit-up? Have you ever done the jumping jacks? Have you ever jumped a rope? All these basic things you know will fix your health issue, your, your, your appearance, which will make you love yourself even more every time you see a reflective surface, something you have the privilege of doing. Now, let's compare the two because it's very important for your mind. One is a decision you make and you're done. You know what? I'm tired of caring what other people think. I'm just going to be myself because I have to live in my body 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year. And if you're worried about what other people think about you, the likelihood is when you're home alone, in your car alone, in the shower alone, you're still worried what the outcome is going to be for that day for a five-minute moment with somebody else. Again, don't try too freaking hard to make people love you. I mean, if you know that you stink, and you know, like go take a shower or wear something nice. Yeah, those are big. Those are big course adjustments. We're not talking about that. But a lot of things in life are just the decision you make in your brain. Instantaneous gratification, instantaneous upgrade. Okay, well, let's say I told you all about that gym regimen, the eating regimen to take all those pounds off and make yourself look amazing. Well, even if you think all that's great and you start doing it right away, you put down the Twinkie, you pick up the carrot. While you're eating the carrot and you're doing your weights, you know you have months and months and months, perhaps, probably about 90 days minimum, to get those rock hard abs, right? Well, that's a huge effort depending on your body. Okay. Which one's easier? Which one's phenomenally easier? The one you make in your brain. Then there's the, the true reality, which is, hey man, that little tiny decision you want me to make in my brain has been installed since I was a child. You could have a parent that scolded you for not doing what other kids did. You could have brothers and sisters that beat you up for not doing what other kids did. The neighborhood kids could beat you up for not doing what they were doing. And so you have trauma. You've almost got PTSD, if not straight up PTSD in your system, which is a lost event inside your psyche that haunts you, but it won't show its face. You should definitely go see my uh, PTSD webs or, um, website, PTSD episode. If you're definitely suffering from any level of PTSD, I don't care if you're a soldier or you were touched when you were a kid, go see the episode. All the mechanics are in there. So if you are still feeling, feeling the anxiety of letting go of that, as if supposedly your whole world unru will unravel in a bad way, what you'll find is this. And this, I uh, told this story probably twice on the show, which is the difference I found between San Francisco and Los Angeles. In San Francisco, it was the most bizarre group of human beings I have ever seen in one place. They don't talk to each other. They barely get along with each other because a lot of them are from other parts within America and other countries. But honestly, if you just took every foreigner out of San Francisco, the problem still exists. Because you got people from all 50 states trying to rob, you know, Silicon Valley of its money. But they don't feel comfortable ever being themselves in that town. Except the more outrageous neighborhoods where they're totally themselves. Castro and Mark at the center of the gay community. Those dudes are themselves. Seriously, they're so themselves, it's crazy. But you go out to the quote-unquote normal areas, and now you've got a bunch of just tension everywhere, from work tension to family tension to neighbor against neighbor tension, for no reason. The amount of beautiful people I met there, both internal and externally, who should have been so confident with themselves, who were behaving as if they were ugly, who are behaving as if you don't like them for some reason, even though you had nothing against them, in fact, you really like them, was off the chart. I mean, it was like 
taking a Geiger counter into your local grocery store that has never had any atomic event occur, and all of a sudden the, the needle's pegged, and you're like, what is going on in this grocery store? You know, That's what it was like to walk into San Francisco on the meter of people who feel comfortable in their own skin, when it's an absolutely artistically beautiful city. I don't think it was always this way, but in the 90s and the early 2000s, my time there, I literally got there at the beginning of 1991 and stayed to the, uh, the end of 2002. It was insane. It was weird. And so when I came down to California to visit, or sorry, Southern California to visit, that's when I'm, and, and I have to go back home, I noticed this profound difference. And let me just tell you a, a little story before I give you this example in Southern California. We had a friend of ours, my girlfriend at the time and I, one of her friends from the Bay Area, came down here to visit. This is after I moved down. And we took her to Huntington Beach in the car. And she was looking out the window at all the people who were fit, tan, having a great time. But it's every shape and size, if she would have paid attention, is right there in the crowd. Smiles on everyone's faces. Everyone's just like, hey, man, gonna help you out, man, whatever, because that's how we roll. And she said out of the car, or in the car, I should say, but out the window, I could never live here. Well, it's not the traffic. It's not the amount of people, because there's more density up in the Bay Area, and there's just as much traffic up there as there is down here. Don't let anyone ever tell you that line of crap. San Francisco traffic is the worst traffic, man. It doesn't move. That's the problem. You might have jam traffic in LA, but it's moving at least, right? So we asked her, we said, why, why would you say that? That's just weird. And she goes, ah, just, and it was really smug and really Bay Area-ish, which was, everybody's pretty down here. Everyone look at everybody. And her whole thing was like, she was mad at them for being who they are and finding happiness. And in her mind, it mattered by her standards of what humans are supposed to look like that she felt subpar to them. Absolutely untrue. But in her mind, she'd been programmed by up north. She felt comfortable, I guess, if you were to reverse the polarity of what she said, what she was saying was that everybody in the Bay Area is ugly and unhappy. I mean, I'm pretty cynical about the barrier, but I wouldn't say that myself. Unhappy? Yeah. It's super stressful to live in that area, for sure. Ugly? No way. I've met some of the most beautiful uh, women in my whole life up there, for sure. But I was at Venice Beach during one of my visits down. And this counters what my friend said in the car. And this before Venice Beach got destroyed, but... Um, I was in some store, because there's all kinds of cool little stores in Venice, right? I remember this very heavy set girl wearing a bikini. And she had this group of friends around her who were all fit and they looked great in their bikinis. But she had this, she was so like, she's probably about five, seven, but really big, right? Rolls down her body. And this bikini is just hanging on for dear life, right? But this girl was the center of attention within her friends. She ran the little gang of her friends. And she had so much confidence. She, I mean, it was entertaining. I just watched. She was making me laugh. And, and she was just walking, you know. And he, or just the last image of her in my mind was her walking away from her, me. And I couldn't see the straps in her clothing because her rolls were covering them up, right? She's a young girl. And I remember just thinking, you know, uh, pardon the pun, but pound for pound, this girl is more sexy than half the girls around here that look amazing. They're all uptight and weird because they're just trying to play the prissy thing. Like, you can't have me things like, whatever. This girl in front of me, way sexier than you. And why was that? Because that girl in front of me was the most confident person she was being who she wanted to be. Now, whether or not she's going to stay that way, that's her choice. But for that moment, I can tell you, man, she was comfortable in her skin. And she had a bunch of it. Most people don't like to get um, 
suffocated and held down, right? Straight up literal question. Most people don't like to be physically held down and have their oxygen supply removed by a hand over their face, right? We're all in agreement, right? We're all in agreement. Some of you freaks out there are probably like, yeah, I don't know. How long are you going to do it for? But uh, for those of you who just have an instinctual, oh, God, I hate that. That's the worst, right? Okay. I want you to think about the similarity between that. Someone's holding you down, face down, and they're covering your mouth. You can't breathe. You can't move. You're going to die. All because someone is holding you down. Is there a more clean definition of a horrific death? But is there also any better example for when you need to fight back? It's your survival, man. You got to fight back. All right, so you're framing this in your head. Now, what's the difference between that analogy, that story, which you would immediately fight, and someone telling you who you have to be? Someone telling you you can't say what's on your mind. I mean, let's let's definitely insert a little pause between your brain and your mouth. Let's do that little game that Americans are taught not to do. But, you know, as long as you've thought things through a little bit, a lot of times you being who you want to be has nothing to do with interfering with anyone else's life at all. You're just your own thing. You're a reliable person. You're a good person. You're not incorporating into your fabric a bunch of schemes and scams and bad things towards other people. You're a good person. So what do you got to worry about? The amount of times I've had either my girlfriend or a friend of mine or somebody worry about having to give a little speech or having a uh, a real tense communication with another loved one or a boss or something like that, or the other one is their employees. And I'll, I'll be talking to them, you know, coaching them through it. And I'm like, okay, so what's your concern? And they'll say, well, God, I want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to be mean. Now, I got friends that need to worry about that, but they never come to me for any help and they don't ever worry about it. They just go out like, guns a-blazing and, you know, say something very, you know, uncouth during their exchanges. But the people that are worried, I always have this, this thing I say, and I always see this transformation on their face of like, oh, yeah, it's much better. And I'm glad I found a way to say it on this show because I think in 500 plus episodes, I've never said this, which is the following. If you're a good person, and you probably are, guess what? You don't have the genetic fibers to do what you're worried about. You don't have the ability to say anything that's uncalculated to a group of people or an individual. You can't offend somebody slash make them angry because you don't have it in your fiber. And if you're worried about it, you got to do what I do, which is you tell the person initially about the elephant that's in the room in your brain. You go, hey, look, got to tell you something, but you know, I love you, man. And I mean this just from the bottom of my heart. Got to figure this thing out. You know that thing you do? Da, da, da. You know what I said that the other day and then you did this? I'm trying to understand it because I don't get it, but I, I need to either understand it and then we can move forward and you can continue doing it, or I need to understand it and I need you to understand it, so maybe we don't do that as much, if at all. And then poof, you're having a great conversation with somebody. Now, there's a third species of this entire thing. First two being youthful peer pressure and then the more acidic adult peer pressure. Because it just gets more multidimensional as you get older, right? When you're a kid, it's just the asshole in the neighborhood. When you get older as an adult, it's your employer, it's your wife, it's your husband, it's your kids, it's the public, it's that, right? I'm willing to bet at least half of you have seen this online in the last four months, especially in 2020. And someone makes a fairly large post in paragraph form on their social media, usually Facebook, because Twitter doesn't allow you to express yourself. 
But they'll start off by saying, hey, folks, I have worried about what people thought about me for a really, really long time. But I'm tired of worrying about what other people think about me. So from this point forward, we're drawing a line in the sand, and I'm going to be who I am. And if that rubs you wrong, I'm really sorry. I'm not trying to rub you wrong. But I can't do this anymore. I can't live in a lie of who I am as a person. Like I said in a few episodes back, a buddy of mine from high school is getting all the sexual reassignment sur- sur- surgeries. I think he might even be done. And he is now a she. And when I asked him, I said, look, dude, we've known each other forever. Like, when did you know this was the case? And he's like, always, man. He goes, I got married and had two daughters. And I knew the whole time I was something else. Okay, I can trust that guy's instinct, right? But my point is that we make decisions sometimes and we need to let other people know that we've made the decision. He knew he was going to show up at events as a woman. And he doesn't want people to treat him wrong now, what he needs to know. In fact, he skipped our last reunion, and I think it was because of these decisions. And I pushed into his mind, look, dude, you're not the only person who's uh, different like this. And those other people show up, and we treat them like gold. Now, sadly, we do have one member of my class, that uh, a gentleman who is gay, and he never shows up because he's worried. It's like, dude. It's, it's 2020, man. It ain't 1987 anymore. But you may need to put that line in the sand, go to your closest folks, let people know if you're going to make a very distinct change. It doesn't always have to be a sex change. But uh, if you're like, look, man, I, I dig our president or I don't like our president, whatever. I mean, it's, it's so in vogue to hate today, isn't it? That's what's in vogue. Do harm is in vogue. What frightens me, in a way, is the uh, the old phrase "mob rules." Now, have you ever heard of mob rules attached to a group of people going around singing Christmas carols, handing out food to homeless people? Just being kind to other people. A big mob of people mows everybody's yards one day. A bunch of mob people clean everybody's cars. Has mob rules ever been attached to something good? Ever. In my life, it's never been done. By the way, if you haven't heard Dio's Black Sabbath song, Mob Rules, it's, a, it's an awesome song. It will teach us all a few things. Mob rules is always attached to pure, concentrated evil and ignorance, all mixed up in a gray soup. And it's always responsible for the physical and psychological destruction that can only be compared to a Cat 5 hurricane, an F5 tornado, that's just laying waste to the land of which it, it just traversed. A Genghis Khan, just wipe of all things. Maybe Alexander the Great, just destroying things. And what's funny is we know that if we were to ever have a time machine, like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, what is it, part three coming out here soon? Let's hope that's good. If we could go back and interview a Genghis Khan warrior and we could speak the fluent language, we would hear a million reasons why their raping and pillaging across Eurasia and, and parts of Europe was the greatest thing ever. Right while they're doing it. Again, like I said in the previous episode, Iago is not a bad guy to Diago. Just to us who are watching his destruction from the outside. We have cities around the world with misled people using false excuses to do what they do. We have foreign infiltrators paid for by George Soros coming over here who are getting ceremoniously executed every time they're caught. The interesting thing is, is that when I was young and life was good, there were, you know, 
it wasn't like it was the first time we'd ever heard of stories of the Ruskies coming over and taking over America and paratrooping in your backyard. What do you think the Patrick Swayze movie, uh, Red Dawn was all about? It was engaging that little fear complex and putting together a scenario that although kind of, kind of silly, still kind of clicked in your brain. Oh yeah, I guess that could happen. Yeah. That's really weird. You know, and today it's happening all around the world. And what's interesting is we have these, these polarizing moments. And I'm saying these things because there's a bunch of decisions that have to be made in each one of us to figure out what the hell we stand for at this point. We're passing useless laws on top of other laws at this point just to make a bunch of people feel comfortable. It's really strange. I don't want to get into exactly which ones, but a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Groups that are protected by laws are passing groups to specifically protect those groups with the same exact laws. And then you see it all over the internet like it's an accomplishment. And you're like, really? Okay, whatever. You know, It's like the old Dennis Miller joke. The ad in the back of the National Enquirer that says, uh, avoid mail fraud, send $5. And then he goes, honey, I think I'll send 10. We'll be doubly protected. But if you understand sovereignty and tyranny, the two opposing factors, then you'll understand why France was doing what they were doing in Paris, and you'll understand why Brexit was doing what it was doing. And now the latest version is Hong Kong. All right. It's going to get messy over there, people. It's going to get real messy. You deserve to be who you are. If there's no other thing that you'll ever hear or ever accept out of my voice, that is something, hopefully, that sinks in. You deserve to be who you are. Whatever that is, man. Now, sadly, sadly, that statement is probably better made in 1977 and not in uh, 2020. We do have individuals who are um, mentally ill who uh, you know, like to hurt kids and those kind of people. I'm probably not talking to those kind of people. I'm talking about very simple, normal people like us. Again, if I said, are you a good person? And you had to make a decision. How do you even give me a real answer? Well, yeah, I'm a good person. But if you really thought about it, okay, well, am I a good person? You don't know. Well, that's the beauty behind common law. That's the beauty. You just say, okay, today, not yesterday, but today, am I a person who from this point forward is going to, am I going to hurt anyone else to get ahead? Is that the kind of person I am? Have I ever been that kind of person? Have I ever done it one time? You can just do a real simple calculation. See it from their perspective. Now, it doesn't mean that if you broke up with a person because they're not good for you, that you're a mean person. You did them both yourself and them a favor. That maybe you cheated on somebody. Physically, mentally, whatever. But as long as you're committed not to get in that situation again, you haven't done it for a while, and you could probably say, well, you know, I had my bumps. Humanity is a hell of a thing to experience. But right now, yeah, I'm really in a good place. We are capable of being good people to the degree we create a great country to live in. Sadly, folks misunderstand a lot of that. Uh, the, the gentleman I sat down with who has a lifelong career in trying to make himself feel comfortable in his own skin was right out of the gate, you know, I don't think you should be able to have a gun. Okay. It's like hitting my first rodeo on that conversation. The dude has got the privilege to say that phrase to me because he lives in a country where guns gave him that permission, that capability of saying that. Obviously, his history of gun grabbing is at zero, absolute zero, or he's in some form of denial. But we're at a point now where forces in this world are trying to make 
some very bad changes. And this is going to sound sort of um, all-American, America, arrogant. But let's look at the world right now, 2020. The European Union has done nothing more than bankrupt the entire European community, which is why the Queen wanted out. She wanted the pound sterling to be secured. Canada has the Queen's money. Australia, King's uh, Queen's money. I think New Zealand as well. Hong Kong had it. Now, Putin, he's living in gangster land. He is literally, you know, sort of a mix between Rodeo Drive and Dodge City. Yeah, well, China's all communistic. And you've got some countries in the Eurasian areas. Of course, the Middle East. It's a mix-up between Sharia law and normality. There's, there's some normality that's getting popular over there. Women are starting to drive. It's good. But guarantee you, if somebody says they want to practice Sharia law in Saudi Arabia, then they can. and probably do. That means a lot of rights are different between our two worlds. Africa's getting raped. South America's getting raped. So the only country, and you can correct me if you like, I, I, I respect you. The only country that's got an army, because okay, there are little factions in Europe that still hold out, is America. We're hanging on to Magna Carta. We're hanging on to a common law base of a country. Now, we're not perfect, man. But they're trying to do the massive squeeze right now. And what I'm trying to get sort of a beat on, because there's those of you in all the countries I mentioned who are fighting back, trying to get rid of the European Union, you know. What I don't understand about Australia, and I've heard an interesting conspiracy about Australia too, was that it's supposed to be a penal colony out of Europe, out of England, right? All the prisoners are taken way, way far away. And apparently some of the historians are now finding out that that wasn't even true, that they were actually murdering these people in the middle of the ocean. They were like, we don't need to take them to an island completely on the other side of the world. We'll just push them off in the ocean. Who's going to know? <laughs> They're not going to go to Australia to check it. And then when they finally started migrating there, you have non penal colony families moving there. I'm sure you have some as well, but they're looking at the displacement of the Aborigines and when this actually occurred. And the dates don't match up, but so for another episode. But okay, let's say you believe that history. Why on earth would you have your captor's face on your money? I guarantee if America considered itself a penal colony of Europe, there's no European czar, king, queen is going to be on our money. We just told you to go F yourself. We took this place from you. And that's your punishment for creating the tyranny you had in Europe. What's really interesting is, is that, and I get this from people in Europe, okay? So I can't really personally have an opinion that's terribly rooted. But some of my friends from Europe are like, okay, Europe is always trying to lecture America about how to handle guns and freedom of speech and all this other stuff. When Europe de facto has the longest recorded history of tyranny and suffering and monarchy in the world, the most suffering as a result of bad leadership and complicit citizens is in Europe. And the EU is holding their head up like they're not going to be doing it again when they have Agenda 21 that first removes about 95 to 99% of the population of the planet and enslaves the rest. Why am I bringing that up in this episode? It's not off topic. You have to be yourself. You have to stand up for the rights that you want to live by. If you have a king and queen in your country, do you really want them? In your country? I mean, not like you have to get rid of them physically, but just do you want that to be involved with your government? Does your government really represent you? Big question. I know that the peer pressure in Europe is massive to go along with what's going on. 
There's a whole history of it. You don't get a Hitler without compl- uh, complicity in this in the people. You don't get a Mussolini without the citizens just laying down every single time. These crazies. It's one dude with the few guys that are helping him out. And these people get to exist for decades and destroy the world. It blows my mind that any king and queen have ever arisen in human history. But how did they do it? They create lore like King Arthur to try and convince you that Uther Pendragon put that person in the castle. And if you go against that person, the dragon will come out of the ground and destroy your family. How many of you remember the movie Mars Attack? I just mentioned it the other day. Jack Black was in the movie. And it was a little family living in an RV. I think he had a little brother too. He was looking up to him. And they played him like a moron. The whole family was a bunch of inbreds. And it was that he wanted to go off and join the military and be a big, you know, U.S. soldier kid in the 50s, right? And they played it like that. Because what they were trying to show, I guess Tim Burton or whatever, was trying to say, this kind of soldier is very, very dangerous. Because that soldier is the one that put the king in power and keeps him in power. Mexico, federales, same thing. 39 families, this is what I've been told several times. 39 families run Mexico, plus or minus one or two. Okay. Wow, those people are in easy to find. They're in ample supply. And if they get killed, you find another one, put them right in that same position, boom, still in power. Do you want to be those kind of people? Why do we stress education on this show so much? You know, again, my friend who's a psychologist told me, I've said this a couple times on the show, but it's important to remember, that they put a cap on the intelligence quotient, the IQ of a cop in the United States to make sure it is as low as possible so they can get them to do anything that they're told to do. They don't have the enlightenment to look at this and go, I'm not going to do that. That's against the Constitution. That person deserves, you know, some help. Now, obviously, what happens over time is they bring him in through the academy. Let's just say, maybe, maybe if this is, I mean, he showed me the reports. He showed me because he used to work in law enforcement. Because he showed me like I wouldn't believe him. I actually believed him, but he did show me the, the statistic on a piece of paper on a website. They get smarter over time just because that's what happens in life. And eventually, you hit that wise soul that's like, okay, let's drive this guy home. Instead of killing him in a Wendy's parking lot just because he's drunk. I'm sitting in his car asleep. What a great idea, right? A little bit of humanity, right? What's happening in 2020 is that everyone's finding something to stand up for. And that's a very empowering thing. Obviously, a lot of people are waking up in your 17 movement thing. And they've learned about all these crazies that are hurting people, hurting children primarily. But then you have your folks that just woke up yesterday, kind of. Like they've been utterly asleep, completely underneath a rock. And they woke up and what did they do? They started to suck down this media machine with the fake news and all this propaganda. And now they're fighting you on the other side of the dinner table. They don't have any knowledge about anything. They're sound bited to beat the ban and they won't research anything because they don't know how to do it. They don't want to be wrong because they don't want to lose face. So they fight that too. Again, my definition of a liberal at this point in my life is research nothing, know everything. That's what this guy was that I just met. Interesting, right? All they want to do is go to Snopes.com, written, uh, run by a complete human degenerate, right? I just uh, recently saw the picture of, what is it? Um, it's, I'll put it this way. It's a fairly convincing picture of Senator Schumer Kissing a little girl in the mouth on some island. It's a little black girl. So it's not his granddaughter necessarily, unless there's something about his family I don't know. 
but maybe he has a granddaughter like that. Don't know. And I went to Snopes because someone gave it to me. I was like, oh, come on. You know, let's make sure this is like so random. It doesn't really mean anything. Right. And so I looked it up on Snopes and it goes, this is false. You read it underneath the picture and Snopes admits, well, we don't know where this photographs come from. We can't confirm or deny it. Well, you just denied it. So what's going on? Horrible, horrible, extra propaganda. The dude takes paychecks from George Soros. We have an immediate need for people to feel comfortable as who they are as human beings, because what ends up happening is this. Instead of you being a a malleable piece of clay, you start to, which means people can infect you with things. If you're in that state of change, the state of flux, someone can reach into you and change you. Okay, once you make a decision about who you are, even if it's version 1.0, you harden. You get a good, um, resilient shell around you. Now people can't influence you so much. Now what they'll do is, you know, if you run into your liberal friends, they'll start calling you names and throwing stuff at you and whatever. Because you're not like them and there's only one way and it's the research nothing, know everything way. So you got to get yourself in check first. And then the next thing you got to do is look around the world and go, oh my God. Agenda 21 was renamed Agenda 2030. Go see my episode on it if you haven't. Go listen to every Rosa Corey interview on planet Earth. K-O-I-R-E. And understand that in 10 years, you won't recognize Earth if they get their way. You will think you are in some dystopian spin-off movie from Brazil by Terry Gilliam. It will be the next book that was never written by, you know, George Orwell. Or a follow-up book to Brave New World by Huxley. You will not recognize this planet. And what's going to be interesting is, if all fails and someone hears me say that and they don't believe it, and we fail, and you manage to survive. You're, you're getting your head shaved. You're getting your white robe. You're being pushed around by a Boston Dynamics robot with a cow prod on the end. And these words ring in your brain. You will think, oh crap. I should have done something 10 years ago when I had a chance. But when he told me that it could happen in 10 years, I thought, impossible. As if 2020 hasn't proven to you that the impossible, ridiculous, baseless thing that we're doing to the world right now could ever happen. You, in 2019, you wouldn't have believed me. If I told you, oh, we got a common cold, it's got a 0.04 death rate of a single percent. Do you think we'd shut the whole world down for that? Do you think we'd crash every business and every economy? Uh, pull our kids out of school? Do you ever think that would happen? Oh, no, man. Why? Especially the dude I met. He would have thrown this out in the media because he's all about feeling comfortable in his own skin at the expense of reality. Because in 2009, we had H1N1 flu. In the United States of America, 60.8 million people got infected with it. And we didn't do any of this stuff. So you're telling me just a few million people get this? Most of them are all recovering. 99.6% people of people are recovering. No way. You're absolutely insane. You conspiracy theorist. And here we are. Here we are. Did Venezuela ever think it'd be Venezuela? Hell no. Did Brazil think it'd ever be Brazil? Hell no. Did Germany, um, 1930, ever think it would be Germany... 1945. No. Ask a Jew who was put on a train. They ever thought that was possible five years before it happened, 10 years before it happened, 20 years before it happened. Doesn't matter how many people you think got killed or not killed, it still happened. We saw it tattoos, stars, all that good stuff. 
They never thought that would happen, and it did. So, this episode is geared at centering you as a human being. Some words of encouragement plus methodologies for you to just say, you know what? He's right. I just need to be myself. Let the world be damned. I don't hurt people. I follow common law. And on that note of common law, I am now going to reassess the entire planet. I'm going to reassess every form of legislation. I'm going to reassess legislation that hasn't been passed that needs to be passed to fix big problems that we have in our part of the world. Because Agenda 2030 needs to be the scarlet letter on everybody's chest that says this person was duped down to destroying all of humanity. So they need to be factored in and thus they can wax poetic at a podium as to how they were once asleep supporting the enemy and that they've changed and they can, they can give you the full story of how that migration occurred. And you do a background check on them and they still don't have any connections with these people. Every day is accounted for. Then they can serve the public. We had 10 years, people. And shit's going to go down way before 10 years happens. Guarantee it. And it's going to blow your mind. And you're not going to believe it. Which is why we have to win. Research everything you possibly can. When you have conversations with people that are resisting you, like the dude I met. You know, at that particular moment, here's what you do. You're not going to change that person. They made a business out of being completely moronic in their life. But what you can do, and what I did, was assess his defense techniques and see if he came up with any new defense techniques. This guy didn't have any new ones except to cut me off every single time he'd ask me about a conspiracy. And I started to prove it to him. He cut me off. I never finished a single sentence. He would... Yeah, we had a third person there too, who was even more than he was, but more polite about it anyway. And he would turn to that dude and try to try to get a buddy to help him out, right? Two votes against one, two votes against one, the whole thing. And then he tried to stress the fact that they don't agree on stuff. And it's like, yeah, genius. Nobody agrees on anything completely at all, no matter what. Husband and wife who go to church. Don't agree on how the Bible is supposed to be interpreted. They simply don't. Not the whole thing anyway. And that's humanity. Because it's randomness. That's why in every sci-fi movie with an artificial intelligence algorithm, man always throws the AI off because we are dynamic. Now, it may be able to big machine learn and guess what we're going to do. But it has to really work hard at it. Whereas for us, it's just ubiquitous to our nature. Anyway, that's this episode. Hope you dug it. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. I'm just going to tell you everything's on there. Video, audio, uh, social media. There's a place to donate. There's a store and all new remastered season one with the first hundred episodes. Anyway, take care of yourself and someone else. And I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now. 